Uh, it's a paper by Gorian Alavich, Yves Kedulek, Christian Schafkart, and Florian Spielmann. And Yves will give the talk. Thank you. Uh, let's turn this on. So, yeah, like uh, was introduced, uh, this talk will be about quantum fully homomorphic encryption, so uh, fully homomorphic encryption of quantum data uh, with some added property, namely verification. But before I dive into uh, the topic, let me first pose a uh, somewhat broader question, namely, if, what's the future of quantum computing? Now, I only have 25 minutes, so I won't answer this question in full detail, but um, by now we've reached kind of consensus that quantum computers will come at some point, and we see already also in this cryptography conference that we're focusing on post-quantum secure uh, cryptography, um, but also uh, people in the quantum algorithms realm are building on useful quantum algorithms. Um, so we know that they're coming, but especially in the beginning, probably we won't all have quantum computers in our homes. They require very uh, expensive hardware to run. Uh, maybe you need very precise lasers or some very uh, super cold refrigerator or something like this. So a more realistic scenario, at least for the beginning of quantum computers, would look a little bit like this. I think that at some point, several uh, places around the world will um, proudly be able to say that they have a universal quantum computer. Um, with universal quantum computer, I mean a quantum computer that can uh, hold a sufficient number of qubits and that can perform any quantum computation on those qubits. And there will be probably lots of other people around the world that are interested in using these, these quantum computing centers. And maybe you already see where the homomorphic encryption here comes in. They will want to send their data over to these quantum computing centers to have some um, computation performed on this data but they will have to have some guarantees. The first one is, of course, that their data remains private. Um, this is what homomorphic encryption will give you. A second requirement is that it's reasonably efficient. I mean, the first, and with efficient, I don't only mean that they don't want the whole computation to take too long, but there's a second aspect here that these uh, clients, these blue dots, they don't want to uh, have to do a lot of work themselves, both in time-wise, but also in terms of the amount of quantum power they themselves need. They might want to only run this on a classical computer. They might be content with having a small quantum device that has some limited functionality or some high error rate. But in these terms, we want to consider efficiency. And lastly, they want to check at the end of the computation that whatever they get back is actually a result of the computation that they wanted to perform. And this is what I call verifiability, and this is what uh, the focus of this talk will be on. So today I'm first uh, well, going to introduce the framework a little bit. We all know hopefully homomorphic encryption here, um, but I want to emphasize what changes if we're uh, talking about the quantum scenario. Then I want to walk you through a already known classical application of fully homomorphic encryption, namely uh, constructing zero knowledge proofs. And the reason that I do this is because it, because it comes, becomes very clear that also in these sort of theoretical applications, the verifiability is a very important uh, aspect. And then in the last part of this talk, I will talk about our contributions, uh, which include definitions of what, what does verifiability mean formally. We give a construction of a uh, quantum fully homomorphic encryption scheme that has this property, and we uh, show one application uh, in the quantum setting. So classical fully homomorphic encryption uh, consists of these four algorithms, which are all well known by now. You have some, some key generation, uh, some encryption that takes a plain text X, produces ciphertext X bar. I'll always denote ciphertext with a bar over them. Uh, then some evaluation function that given an evaluation key, some description of the function f, and some ciphertext produces a different ciphertext, and this whole thing is homomorphic if at the decryption, whatever this, this ciphertext decrypts to is equal to the function applied on our input. And, well, it's possible to construct a scheme that's fully homomorphic, namely that's homomorphic, that it works, works for all functions, under some computational assumptions. Uh, this was first shown, of course, by Gentry in 2009, very famous result. And after that, uh, lots of improvements have been made, mostly on efficiency, um, and also by, by simplifying these computational assumptions. What changes if we move to a quantum setting? So 
so quantum fully homomorphic encryption. What I understand of quantum fully homomorphic encryption, think the things have changed is now instead of having classical uh, plain text, classical data, we have quantum data that we want to encrypt. So there's some quantum state sigma, we want to create some quantum ciphertext, and that also of course means that instead of uh, evaluating a classical function f, we now want to compute some quantum circuit uh, c. But the, the main idea remains the same, that this thing needs to be homomorphic so that the decrypted output is equal to the circuit applied to the input. And so far, uh, the developments in this field have been pretty similar, only a few years behind. So quantum fully homomorphic encryption is also possible in a leveled form under computational assumptions. And it's worth mentioning that these computational assumptions, they're the same assumptions as in any classical scheme that it uses. So you can build a quantum fully homomorphic encryption using classical fully homomorphic encryption as a black box, and you inherit only those assumptions. So if we have improvements in classical FHE, both in terms of assumptions or in terms of efficiency, these directly translate into these, uh, these schemes. And again, we're still focusing on making these things more efficient. And here I want to emphasize again that efficiency, I don't only mean time, but I also mean quantum resources of the client. Ideally, the client can be completely classical. So, applications of fully homomorphic encryption. Well, in my introduction, I already gave you kind of the classical application, this sort of well known uh, story around it, outsourcing of computation. But also in the theoretical uh, realm, classically, we know lots of applications of fully homomorphic encryption. There's multi party computation, functional encryption, private information retrieval, zero knowledge proofs, and much, much more. And in the quantum setting, we don't know many applications yet. It's a younger field of research, so we're still figuring out whether these classical uh, cryptographic primitives also follow in the quantum case, whether they're even meaningful. And while we're trying to do this, we figured out that there is some crucial um, property that classical fully homomorphic encryption kind of has automatically that our quantum fully homomorphic encryption scheme didn't seem to have. And this is verification. And to illustrate this, I want to walk you through this zero knowledge proofs construction from classical fully homomorphic encryption so that you see what this property is and how, how it becomes apparent. So, just a very short introduction into zero knowledge proofs, classical zero knowledge proofs. Suppose you have some NP hard problem, for example, satisfiability. You're given some formula phi and you want to know does phi have a satisfying assignment? Is it satisfiable? And some mysterious, all-powerful being comes along and says, oh, I know, it's satisfiable. But in your story, you're like, okay, that's great. Can you show it to me? Or yeah, can you convince me that it is indeed satisfiable? Should I just believe you when you say this? Of course not. And then this other, this cat tells you, well, I do know a satisfying assignment, W. I'll call this the witness. But I'm not going to tell you. I want to keep this a secret. So now you appear to be at a sort of impasse, like you want to be convinced that this formula is satisfiable, but this other person is not willing to tell you uh, a satisfying assignment. So how can you ever be convinced of this? And a zero knowledge proof kind of gives a solution to this. It's an interactive protocol between the two of them, such that at the end, Alice is convinced that the, that the cat knows a witness, but she doesn't know anything about the witness. So how can we build this using FHE? This is already a, a known construction that was uh, described by Boris Barak in 2012. Um, so the prover, the cat, he knows a witness. Let's start with trying the following. He just, uh, yeah, he just encrypts his witness using the fully homomorphic encryption scheme and sends over the encryption to Alice. Now Alice is going to set up kind of a challenge for the prover. She does the following. Privately, she flips a, a random bit B, and on the, on the witness, the encrypted witness that she just received, she evaluates the witness check function. The witness check function is just a function that returns 1 if it's a correct witness, and 0 if it's not. And she stores the result in a uh, ciphertext C bar. Then what she does is she multiplies B with C bar. So she evaluates the function multiplied with B on C bar. And this resulting uh, ciphertext D is what she sends over to the cat. And now we see that if, if this W was indeed a correct witness, then C bar will be 1. So D will be equal to B, right? D, uh, B times 1 is B. Whereas if W was not a correct witness, then 
uh, c will be zero always, so d will always be zero. And now we ask the cat to send back the decrypted form of d. So if it was, uh, and, and then with this result, we accept, we accept his proof if and only if uh, d was equal to b. Now, as we just saw, if he sent a correct witness, then d does contain, in, in, indeed contain b, so we can just do this. And if uh, w was not a correct witness, then this information that you sent to the cat is just an encryption of zero. So in order to win this game, he has to send, basically guess the random bit b, and this is probably hard. So from this thing, we can see that indeed the cat cannot, cannot really cheat, but the verifier can. In principle, we have no guarantee that she actually, these computations that she did here to arrive at this in ciphertext d, d bar, we have no guarantee that they're actually the result of these computations. Maybe she's just sending back, back the first bit of w, and the cat is just decrypting it for her, and she learns something about w. And this is not what's supposed to happen in zero knowledge proof. So let's go back a little bit and try a slightly different method. So instead of the cat sending over the decryption of d, he just commits using some bit commitment scheme to this decrypt decrypted value, but he doesn't reveal it yet. He first asks Alice, give me a proof of your uh, FHE computation. And we, I think of this as a transcript, and in principle she can always do this. She can just give a list of all the steps that she did in her computation. So she says, okay, I received this ciphertext from you, then I flipped this bit, and then I added, did, performed these actions that are described by my evaluation algorithm, it's just step by step. She can give uh, sort of proof that she arrived from uh, W bar to D bar in a sort of legal manner. Uh, and then the cat just checks what it, checks his transcript. He just, well, he can just do that. He just also reproduces these steps. Uh, and if it's okay, then he reveals D. And then Alice does the same, um, the same check again. And this construction shows that fully homomorphic encryption, we can use it to construct zero knowledge proofs. Um, but it's crucial that the cat can verify Alice's evaluation. So this is what we just saw, that verification of computation is crucial in applications, both practical in the sense that you want to, as a client, you want to know whether the computation was performed um, was actually the, the, the computation that you wanted, but also theoretical if you want to construct other cryptographic primitives, such as zero knowledge. And classical FHE kind of has this verifi verification automatically. Like I just argued, you can just give a transcript. All the steps are kind of deterministic. You might need some randomness to perform it, but if you just say this is the randomness that I used, maybe it was predetermined, then anybody can check this. But in the quantum setting, things are a little bit different, because Maybe Alice needs to perform some measurements during her computation. And as you may know, in a quantum setting, if you measure a qubit, this qubit collapses, and there's some inherent randomness in there. So she may write in her transcript, I measured this qubit, and then I got a zero as an outcome. Please believe me. Like, there's no way you can check this. You cannot just get a uh, complete description of the quantum state at every point in her computation. It's just not possible. So here it's, it's slightly more different. And Difficult, and we have to think a little bit about how to approach this. So now I get to our contributions. Um, first of all, we have to define a little bit more formally what do we mean with verifiable quantum polyomorphic encryption. And more specifically, we give uh, a semantic definition, uh, which I'll get to in, in a moment, which sort of intuitively grasps what we want. And we also give a, a verifiability definition in terms of indistinguishability gains. This is easier to work with in security proofs, but it's not so intuitive to see why it captures what we want. And but we show that these two are uh, they are equivalent. And finally, I want to mention, but I don't have time to go into it too much, that we also have to rethink compactness a little bit here, because usually compactness states that at the decryption time. Um, the amount of work that the client has to do cannot depend on the size of the function or the circuit that you're evaluating. But in this case, we want to verify that, he, that the evaluator did some kind of circuit. So it at least means to read the circuit description, right? So we come up with a slightly more subtle definition that allows the client to do some amount of classical work, 
but uh, the quantum, quantum work that has to do it at least has to be uh, independent of the circuit and there's some more subtleties there but I don't have time to go into it. Um, secondly, we get a construction of a verifiable quantum fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Um, as ingredients, this construction uses any classical fully homomorphic encryption scheme that is um, that is post-quantum secure, because of course we're in quantum setting now. It uses <coughs> classical authentication code, MAC, and it also uses some quantum authentication code. <coughs> and it's worth mentioning that this quantum authentication code is information theoretically secure, so the only computational assumptions that we need come from these top two, two ones. And also the scheme that we end up with is leveled, and this is because we have we, our evaluation key is a quantum state and it's sort of consumed during the computation. So we need to know in advance some upper bound to the size of the circuit. Uh, but this also means that we only need a, a leveled classical application scheme. And finally, we show an application which is kind of like a proof of concept. It's not a new result, but we show that using classical one-time programs and a scheme that has this, Q this QFG with verification, you can super easily build uh, quantum one-time programs. Uh, the previous proof of this was quite complicated, it was like a 40-page paper, and we give a much simpler construction. So this is a sort of proof of that this QAG with verification captures some, some powerful uh, primitive. So before I delve into the, um, into the definition of uh, quantum polyomorph encryption with verification or verifiability, I want to talk about some related topics to get a little bit of inspiration and some feeling about what it is that we exactly want. And the first topic is quantum authentication. Uh, in, in the quantum setting, authentication implies encryption. So if you have an authentication code for a qubit, um, that also necessarily means that your qubit is also encrypted. And in this sense, we can view quantum authentication as a kind of verifiable homomorphic encryption within quotation marks that only works for the identity circuit. So this cat, he can uh, encrypt a qubit, give it to Alice, and once he gets it back, he can verify that she performed the identity circuit. In other words, she didn't touch it. Uh, and there are several uh, quantum authentication codes out there that are also information theoretically secure. And we're going to, going to use this last one, this trap code, because it has some nice properties uh, concerning measurement of ciphertext. One step up from this is quantum computing on authenticated data. So this starts with authenticating your input um, and evaluating some function on it together. So the cat who had, who had the input and encrypted it talks to Alice and during the computation they go, kind of go back and forth and maybe the cat gives some, some extra challenges to Alice that she has to respond on. Alice gives some proofs intermediately that she's still holding the right state that kind of thing, and in the end, the cat has some verification that the that whatever he gets back, whatever he ends up with, is the correct output of the computation. And of course, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the what I already mentioned, homomorph, fully homomorphic encryption, with, where there's no interaction needed during the evaluation, but there's also completely no verification of the answer. And our goal today is kind of to combine these last two things, or the best part of these last two things, to have uh, a, a homomorphic encryption scheme, so no interaction needed, but to be able to verify the, uh, the result at the end. And as an ingredient, we'll use this quantum authentication scheme. So, um, how do we do it? How do we find verification in QFG? We replace the decryption function by a function that we call Verdec for verified decryption. And this function, rather than just taking a uh, key and a output ciphertext. It also takes an, well, the decryption of the circuit, of course, and something that I'll call proof. This is a classical object, so no quantum state, um, but it's just some, yeah, for, think about the transcript for the classical case. And it produces uh, an output ciphertext and some accept or reject flag. And as a sort of, uh, well, we, we kind of assume that if if the uh, flag is set to reject, then this output state is just some dummy state, like all zero state, for example. <coughs> and the real image now kind of looks like this. So we start with an input state sigma and some side information. This is just some extra thing that might be floating around, it's possibly entangled with sigma, but let's not worry about it too much. This is encrypted. The, the encryption is sent to the adversary, Alice. 
and she produces a state that she claims is the result of her uh, own morphic evaluation, and she appends to it some classical thing, this is why it's like double wires, uh, I mean classical state with this. She's, she appends some kind of proof that this is actually the correct output of the computation. Then this magical Verdeck function comes along and produces the, the output state and an accept reject flag. And the real or the ideal world that we would like to mimic is the following. Just the circuit C is applied to the input. Whatever comes out, well, C applies to the, the to the input. This is the quantum notation for this. Um, and there's some simulator that just acts on the side information just like Alice would, and it's accepted and it's all fine. So we say that a, scheme, a Q of a G scheme has verifiability if for any polynomial time Alice, there exists a simulator such that for all the inputs, all sigma and all side information, whatever comes out here is indistinguishable. And you may notice that this is not achievable because what Alice can do she can just throw out the input and like force a reject. She can just put an empty proof, whatever, and a simulator is not able to simulate this. So we have to give the simulator a little bit of extra power by saying that the simulator can also force a reject. So you can also choose to output reject, uh, and then the, the output will just be discarded and replaced by this W state. So this is our semantic definition of verification. We also give an indistinguishability gain that encapsulates the same thing. Um, I have a little bit more time, so I will go into uh, the idea of the construction. Just to give you a very, very brief idea of what's going on. So how do we actually build a verifiable Q of HE scheme? Well, we need to specify encryption, evaluation, decryption. So for the encryption, we start with just authenticating our state using the trap code. The trap code works as follows. You start with a single qubit, the one you want to encrypt and you uh, apply some quantum error correcting code. So this builds in some redundancy and you have your, your like several qubits that together encode your, your single qubit. Then you hide these qubits in between some traps. So these yellow and red ones, they're, they're sort of dummy qubits, I'll call them traps, but they're just dummy qubits that are in state zero, for example, in state plus. And you put them in random positions and only you know where, where your real data is hidden. And then on top of that, you apply a quantum one-time path, which is like the quantum equivalent of a one-time path, so it completely hides all the information. Um, and the reason that this is authenticating is that if somebody would like to uh, manipulate the data, say perform an X operation, which is like a NOT operation, then you would first have to guess a sufficient number of these blue positions and then apply x to all of them, for example, or at least to uh, some distance, like depending on the distance of the error correcting code, apply uh, an x operation to many of them without accidentally setting off one of these traps, one of these dummy codes. Because when we're decrypting, we'll remove the quantum one-time pad and check whether these traps are still untouched. And if they are, then we'll say, okay, this is rejected. So in order to uh, manipulate this state, you kind of have to know where, the, where these traps are, and otherwise it's, it's super impossible. Oh, I should have mentioned that the secret key contains both the key to the, one, uh, to the quantum one-time pad and the positions where they are. This is the secret part of the encryption. Um, and now as an additional thing, we encode the secret key so these secret things with a classical FHG scheme and a message authentication code. And we, we just give this to the evaluator. So the evaluator still doesn't have any information about really these positions, but he has some encoded uh, thing here. And the reason that we do this is for the evaluation. Well, I just argued that the evaluator cannot change this authenticated state. But we want him to. We want him to perform computations on it. So if he cannot do anything, then, then we don't have, really have anything. So what we give him is we give him the power to change the keys. So if he wanted to, for example, do this NOT operation here, what he would do is just apply the NOT everywhere, set up some traps, set up some traps, 
but then flip the keys for the one-time path so that the traps are kind of restored. So if he changes a zero state accidentally to a one state, then he can update the key again to, be, to have, let it be zero again. And if he has the uh, encrypted uh, information about the secret key, then he can do this homomorphically. And in this way, he can kind of manipulate the data, but he can only do this in the allowed ways, because at the end, we will check whether, whether all of these FHE key updates are legal. So if he says, uh, I'm going to perform an escape, we'll know about it, because he has to put it in his transcript, and otherwise, uh, he just cannot touch the state. So our, our method here is to ensure that during the whole computation, we have a authenticated state, always, uh, with a certain key that belongs to it, and this key is updated throughout the computation. The evaluator does this for us, but we check at the end uh, whether he did this correctly. And notice that this means that our check is also completely classical, because this transcript is completely classical. So to summarize, uh, our contributions consist of formalizing uh, what verifiability means in quantum fully homomorphic encryption. We give an explicit construction of a scheme that has verifiability. Um, and we prove that it's secure under computational assumptions and that it has this verifiability property. And we give an application to show how you can <coughs> construct quantum one time programs from classical one time programs and uh, verifiable QFHE. And of course, the obvious future work is to figure out which of the, all these other uh, applications of classical FHE carry on in quantum. Question in the back of the back. Uh, to come back to your motivating example with your knowledge, I uh, don't really don't see fully how you can apply uh, the verifiable P of H E because in the definition of the verifiable P H of E has declared that which verifies that the curves in one step. Mm -hmm. But in the zero knowledge protocol, it was actually crucial that it's first decrypted, then committed to, and then verified. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a good point. So the application that I showed to, to zero knowledge actually means that there's some, some sort of separation. There is some uh, verification that you can do first, and then there is some decryption that you can do after. Um, this was, of course, an application in the classical realm, so there you can separate this. Uh, we haven't figured out how to build zero knowledge. Um, from quantum fully homomorphic encryption yet. We think we have construction, but we haven't proven it yet. But in our scheme, this verification and decryption step is also kind of separated because, um, well, the verification involves this checking of this transcript, and then only if this, this accepts, we, we do the decryption. The reason that we put it into one algorithm is that the decryption also performs <coughs> some additional check there because it still measures the traps. So we didn't want to separate this into two separate algorithms because then we would have a decryption function that could still choose to reject. So there are some details to figure out there, but uh, in principle it shouldn't be a pro problem for the application. Okay, but so far the zero is the motivation, but not something that's solved, right? Um, we so solved the one -time program yeah, we solved the one-time program, and we have a candidate for this for zero knowledge for QMA, but we we haven't figured out the complete proof yet. Okay. But we think it might be a future thing. Thank you. My first question, uh, please go back to the construction, uh, your steps. Oh, sorry. Uh, this one? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, is it only the third step are quantum? Is quantum? Uh, no, all of the steps are quantum. So this, this blue dot in the beginning is already a qubit. So this first step is a quantum error correcting code, which involves oh. Uh, creating extra quantum states and entangling them with your qubit and this all quantum thing. Uh, the second step is not really a quantum step, it's just scrambling your qubits with storage kind of thing. But it's not really a computation, and this third step is also a simple quantum computation. But all of these steps are relatively, sort of the oper quantum operations that they require are relatively simple. So the, the hard, hard uh, type of gates, for example, what we usually think the T gate, is a hard type of, of gate to do in a quantum computer, the client doesn't have to do this. But yes, you're right, the client does have to do quite some quantum work in order to encrypt the state. Mm, you mean for all the quantum gates, uh, it satisfies the uh, FHE? 
Uh, yes, so our homomorphic encryption scheme can do universal quantum computation. Is that your question? Okay, thank you. That was a question too. Then you said you had two questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other question? Okay, if there ah, there is still one question. No problem. If you ask the last, there is a second one. Uh, <laughs> one, one. One approach that I would think of in, in general if I have a QFHD, and you said the problem is I can't just reveal my transcript because I have these measurements. Uh, what would happen if the uh, and, and crypto, no, yeah, well, that is, yeah. Um, would instead of doing measurements, just uh, purify the computation and then as a proof send over the rest of the purified state. Would that also be a very QFHD scheme? Or um, it might be possible to construct a scheme like that. For our specific scheme, this is not really possible because um, for the evaluation of this, this T-gate, which is one of the gates for the universal uh, computation, the evaluator has to perform uh, measurements, and the result of those measurements are classical outputs that she did, then, then injects into the classical FHE scheme, and she uses this to do the key update. Independent on the key, she has to do other. So there's lots of. But she could other the, for the classical one is for So it might work. The evaluator is the prover, right? I mean, measurements by the provers don't matter. only send Yeah, I think I think it might it might be possible, but. It, would become a very big superposition because of how these, these T-gate gadgets work. It's sort of depending on the encryption she chooses to do lots of measurements and if she, yeah. So I, yours is it would, so I, I think it would branch out pretty, pretty big, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Yves and all the other speakers again.